But for those who have broken completely free and have built their own pirate ships, as Adam Carolla calls his podcast, mm -hmm. a pirate ship where it's like, hey, you know, fuck you. Arr, I'm a pirate. I can say whatever I want. Then you have total creative freedom. And I think people are finding those outlets more and more these days. Yeah. The Fred Minnick Show is brought to you by Michter's and 291 Colorado Whiskey. And joining the Fred Minnick Show, someone I'm a big fan of, Steve Zabin. What's up, my brother? It is great to be in the Minnick Cave. Do you have a <laughs> nickname for this place? Uh, no, just a studio, I guess. I think, I think you need a nickname right, for well, it. Or sell it to somebody. Ooh. Sell it to you, the highest bidder. Oh, you're talking, you'll see th this, your old school radio, and I noticed like everything is sponsored by. When you, oh, you gotta, yeah. You know? <laughs> if it's not gonna make money, why do it? Right? <laughs> it's like, you're calling on the Fresh Take hotlines, you know, say $5, know. Or, you know. But does it, does that get old though? Do you get tired of it? Well, I mean, you can overdo it. Let's put yeah. it that way. You could definitely overdo it. But I think this special studio, which has an unbelievable array of bourbons needs a name but we'll let it soak okay all right well i tell you what like i'm not really good with coming up with my own names for my stuff so i'll let you do the honor of naming it at whatever point you want as long as it's not like you know mcbooger face remember it's something like the bunghole i'm here in the bunghole it's a it's a bourbon term <laughs> I like right. it. Well, we, it, probably not the right term. I, for no, it, I do like it. I do like it. Is there like another it. bourbon term that could be used? That's not. Uh, good, so. That's not the bunghole. Uh, maybe the cistern room. That's possibly. What, does that sound good? Yeah. Um, Rick House warehouse overused probably. Rick yeah. yeah, I like the Rick House though. This is kind of a Rick House. I mean, you got all these bottles in here, mm -hmm. and is it just me or I'm nervous they could fall off the shelves? And there's a, there are a couple uh, shelves that are waning a little bit. Might need some reinforcement. <laughs> exactly. But um, oh well, uh, you live dangerously. I like. I've it. I've kind of also wondered like what's it gonna what's my face gonna be like if one like collapses in the middle of a show. No. So I wanna I'm like living for that moment. Are there the edge. earthquakes? God forbid here. Um, in Louisville, no. Kentucky, knock not, on wood. Knock on wood, no. Okay. No. Because a good earthquake would bring it all pretty much to the ground. Yeah, I have a friend uh, in D.C. They, when you all have earthquakes over there. We, we've only had a couple, but when we've had them, it's like, whoa, what the hell is that? Yeah, it, it tears them up. Like, yeah. he has, like, he has bands. Uh, not He has those little uh, elastic little bands. Yeah. Because that way it can, like, you know, move a little oh. bit and like the whiskey won't pop out. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. So speaking of whiskey, I selected three uh, fun things for us to taste. One has a sports connection. Bell Floor. Oh, my God. That's named after uh, or it's owned by the uh, the hockey Belfour, player. Yes. Ed Belfour. Yeah. Goaltender. He, he was the um, he's a, a whiskey maker now. And oh that is God. the this is a Stanley super Cup. Super sexy bottle it's pretty cool that is pretty cool now can you buy this now yeah yeah it's available now how much uh, is it i think he's asking 150 for it that's not bad yeah that's really cool okay all right ed belfour's straight rye whiskey mm -hmm. and Spirit that of champions and ed's been in trouble lately he got himself a. did 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 did, the, did the nhl come after him like hey this is too close to the stanley cup or no not that i not that i know okay. of. but he got in trouble he got arrested yeah he got arrested he drank too much one night at a hotel uh, and, usually you know. how do the start of those stories yeah work all right I'm on and then uh a little doc swinson's here okay. now doc swinson's is one of these uh uh really uh really crazy nice. sought after it's kind of developed its own little cult following but it is a 15-year-old. Doc Swinson's. Now, I notice the blue wax seal. Mm -hmm. yep, and I yep. was told that Maker's Mark has very strict copyright on the red wax seal. That's exactly right. And so they have the they have the trademark on the, the dripping of it, which they call the dressing. Okay. And then they have the trademark of it being red. And then we have an old Fitzgerald bottle to bond, an eight-year-old. This right here is uh, up for my whiskey of the year for 2021. And are all these easily gettable? 
or are these rares? These are all rare. These I'm, are all rare. I'm not. Right. I mean, you look when we're when the camera's not on. I'm giving you shelf turds. Well, that's fine. I but, don't care. But when, I just but when we're you know? when the camera's on, I, you know, I got to give it to you good. That's good. Actually, I like no, that. I gave you something pretty special earlier. Yes, you did. Absolutely. Wow, that thing is heavy, huh? It is. Yeah. Is that I pewter? Like it's, it's not like plastic. It's yeah. it's actually metal. Yeah, I think that's pewter. Oh, there we go. Whack somebody in the head with that. All right, so these are th are three of your favorites, or you know, these are just three things that I I pulled off the okay. shelf. Uh, uh, but the this old fits here is one of my favorites for 2021 so far. And by the way, Zay, you get a special uh, a special me. I'm not a not, I'm not an ascot today. I was gonna say you're casual. You're Saturday casual today. I like that. Okay. Starting with the bell, bell floor. floor first, then old fits, mm -hmm. and then the uh, the Doc Swinson. Doc Swinson. That sounds like a the dude should be in Deadwood. Oh, Doc Swinson. Yeah. Did you watch Deadwood? I did. Yeah. God damn. And actually, it was show. because of you, I ended up watching the the movie, which was one of the most disappointing things I've ever seen in my life. It's not good. The movie is is ooh that's ooh that's tasty. Yeah. And bell four. Good net minder, and you got a good whiskey on your hand as well. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. It's got a real uh, kind of tangy, tangy smell there. <laughs> I'm working on the Kentucky Chew, as you call it, where you just kind of give your whiskey a, a chomp or two to get it all through your mouth. Mm. Okay, I like that. It starts out sort of innocently but then comes on at the end as a nice kind of exciting finish. At least that's what my mouth tasted. Who knows if that's real. You know, there is a big old um, maple syrup note there on the finish for me. So How did you get your ability to taste flavors? Uh, it, it started with my, with my recovery from uh, Iraq my, in PTSD. I was in therapy and uh, they they asked uh, my therapist was uh, said you know one of my big things was I had like issues with you know I'd get triggered by like smells it smells uh, sites like anti war signs like I mean I would just I would go from zero to sixty in like an anger kind of thing really fast which you know a, a, a veteran therapist will see that as like hey, this guy's gonna be homeless or in jail or something soon. Right. So she offered this technique called mindfulness for me. And she said, put a barbecue uh, potato chip on your mouth and chew it around and see how it feels on your tongue and think about the the texture of it. Think about how it's hitting your tongue and all these things. And it'll take your mind off of whatever is bothering you. Interesting. And uh, there's a whole technique of mindful eating and everything. I've heard of that. And, I don't uh, practice it, Sam. Well, you know the but eating I've heard part. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> the eating part, I'm not so yeah. uh, good at. Like I'll, I'll, you know, destroy some pizza. But when it comes to the, when it comes to the, I was able to apply that technique into into whiskey, into wine, and really it, it created my career. So that's great. Uh, the tasting side of it. <clears throat> so here we mm. are with the old fits. I like it. It's another one that's a little bit. A little bit different taste, a little bit livelier. How do people improve their, aside from the potato chip trick, should you take like, mm -hmm. is there a kit that would say, smell this, it's cinnamon. Smell yeah. this, it's whatever. And mm -hmm. then you train yourself. It's like training to smell smells. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of those kits. Oh, really? um, and I used to go and uh, I used to buy, um, I used to buy like, uh, scents like at the stores like you go and like get like paprika uh, and i'd buy all of these spices and you can smell it um and there was essential oils that you could buy and like if you go if you live in a town that has a hippie store i call them hippie stores and they have like patchouli and stuff <laughs> those places are gold okay or you could find all, all kinds, kinds of, of stuff sense of the stuff that would be exactly in a bourbon. But you don't want to buy like the candles, the people, the the scents for candles. Okay. Those are all synthetic. You know, oh, okay. You know, so you want to go with like the well, the base, but you can train yourself to smell, but people forget that, you know, the other part is tasting. And the most important part of 
learning how to taste is understanding where it's hitting your tongue. So on the tip of your tongue is where you're getting the sweet stuff and the middle is the savory and the back is where you're going to get uh, the spice and the bitterness will fall in between like the middle and the back palate and uh, on the sides. And if you taste a lot of bitterness, it means you're probably a super taster. Like there's a gene that one of four people have that allows them to taste things that other people can't. Really? And Interesting. Um, and like it's it's difficult to spot it in, in spirit sometimes. But so my going back to these two, I would ask you if we were if we're in the uh, Zabe train your palate moment, let's uh, taste uh, taste the old Forester again and tell me what's the most prominent. Old Fitzgerald, not Old Forcer. Yeah. What's the most prominent spot it's hitting on your tongue? Okay, let me give it one more taste. Let me think about where it's hitting me on my tongue. <laughs> I don't know. I wish I knew where it was on my tongue. I felt it more in the palate of my roof oh. than on my tongue. It's you know this is everywhere. This is a this is a gorgeous whiskey. Old Fitzgerald. Yeah, the eight year the eight year bottle and bond uh, spring twenty one release. Who makes it? This is a Heaven Hill product. Okay. The more I taste it, the more I'm falling in love with it. And the brand has been around Old Fitzgerald for how long? Uh, it's been around for a while. Um, this used to be a Pappy Van Winkle brand ah. uh, when he had Sitzweller. I think you all are going to Sitzweller next. We are, yes. Yeah, so this was originally there, um, but you know they don't make it there anymore. But it's uh, there's no new Pappy Van Winkle being made, right? Uh, not so they make Pappy Van Winkle a Buffalo Trace now. So like all of uh, Weller and Pappy Van Winkle are basically the same okay. recipe. But so they make it all at Buffalo Trace. Stitza Weller, which was the original home of Pappy, you know, it started on Derby Day, nineteen thirty-five. Uh, they didn't, um, you know, they sold in nineteen seventy-two. The Van Winkle family did, and then the then parent company United Distillers sold it uh, in nineteen ninety-four. To uh, or actually, they just stopped using it. They didn't sell it. They sold off their brands. So okay. they sold off like Old Fitzgerald Weller, all these throughout the nineties, and they just stopped. Uh, making whiskey there. All right, I'm going to go to the Doc Stinson. Doc Swinson. Swinson. Would have been on Stinson's. Deadwood. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Here we go. Ooh. Tastes um, bolder. A little bit more... Full of flavor. Might be that uh, 118 proof talking to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> kind of sense that. What's the highest proof you can have? Well, you know, you can get a lot higher proof in like rums and uh, and Irish whiskeys. Uh, but in bourbon, but what's in, typically in, the highest? In bourbon, the highest you really see is 140. Okay. I mean, you theoretically... So, if, as you may recall from the definition of of what bourbon is, it can't go any higher into the barrel at any higher than 125 proof. Okay. But what happens is the water will evaporate while it's in the barrel, depending on where it's stored in the warehouse, and the and proof it, will go up. Right. And uh, you don't really see it very too far out of like 130. Like you, 130 to 135 proof is usually um, is usually the max it'll get. But occasionally you will see uh, 100 140 proof. I I have heard of like 150 and 160 proof, but I've I've never seen it bottled. But I've I've heard it coming out of the barrel like that. Wow, but it, but screaming it's, uh, hot! It it really is. But <laughs> and you know, and what it comes down to is like people, that that high proof is really hard to keep in the bottle. So like it could just be sitting in the store one day and pop it'll just pop out. Really? Yeah. So they have to have like special kind of. Uh, strategies to close that bottle oh my god so it's when you get really high in proof it's nuts okay let's go back to the um let's go back to the bell four bell four okay we're gonna do another lap through yeah and we're gonna choose our winner okay oh all right i didn't know we were into choosing a winner all right here we go yeah that maple like maple and pecans like this is like a this is like having a, a really good Vermont breakfast. 
know why Vermont. I said Vermont. I guess because of the maple. Yeah, yeah. Vermont maple syrup. Okay. All right. Do you taste the maple? I can taste it now, now that you mention it, for sure. Now, what's a note that you taste in there? I mean, kind of maple, but again, this is like, I was thinking about the analogy of somebody who likes bourbon, but doesn't really have mm -hmm. the ability to taste specific notes or, or whatnot. I was watching a soccer game mm -hmm. at the bar last night in Bardstown. It was an MLS soccer game, right? And all I could think about was, okay, this is soccer, but it's American <laughs> soccer, so I know it's crap. <laughs> I know it's not on the same level as Premier League or Bundesliga right, or right. La Liga, all the real high-level leagues. Yep. And yet, even though I'm a sports fan and I know a little bit about soccer, I'm not sure I could distinguish watching the game mm. how and why it wasn't meeting up with your higher league standards. Mm -hmm. And I thought that must be similar in a way to bourbon in that you may like soccer, you may watch soccer, but you can't distinguish per se what's the difference. You know, once you get to a certain level in any endeavor in life, it's harder to tell what's the best and what's not quite the right. 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 Yeah. Like if I'm watching a golfer, I know golf. I could see a guy playing golf who's a scratch player mm -hmm. who hits the ball a mile. It's got great touch around the greens. And if I didn't know any better, I'd say, why aren't you on the PGA Tour? Mm -hmm. And the answer is because I know that last one-tenth of 1% that separates them from the tour. And I would imagine with bourbons, you've now come to a point where you can discern that one-tenth of 1% difference. Yeah. that is it's A lot of work and training has gone into drinking bourbon. <laughs> exactly. It's all, it's all work. I can't believe the number of samples you have in boxes. <laughs> that it's your job to to drink and taste and yeah. put a grade on. Are you putting a grade on those samples? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you grade? What's the system? Uh, so it's a uh, one to five point. It's, it's a hundred point system okay. that, that basically grades uh, color, uh, uh, aroma, okay. taste, and finish. Okay. And the taste is the highest portion of the of the score, followed by finish, aroma, and then color being last. Uh, but uh, you know, you get uh, you taste something, you're like, you know what? This is a C. This is a C student. You know, right? And that's generally everything is usually at least it. If it's not like getting a seventy, um, it's just <laughs> you're just not there. It's just not there. Yeah. But most yeah. stuff is 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 drinkable. All right, we're going to the second one again. Second one, yeah. Which is Old Fitzgerald. And as we get into this, I want to talk to you a little bit about like the state of like sports media because yes, let's do it. It's fucking shit. <laughs> it it's, is so bad. It, well, it depends on where you go. That's for sure. I mean, there's, I think there's emerging sports media that has the opportunity to be really good quality and compelling, but I think it's all off of your traditional delivery platforms. You mm -hmm. know. I think podcasting is great because it allows you to give a completely unfiltered view, for the most part, of whatever it is you're talking about. Some leeway for expletives, some leeway to talk about things that would maybe otherwise get you canceled. Mm. But the problem is, even if you talk about something in your podcast, if you are getting a check from some traditional company, anything you say can and will be used against you with your regular employer. So you're still a bit curtailed in that regard. Yeah. But for those who have broken completely free and have built their own pirate ships, as Adam Carolla calls his podcast, mm -hmm. a pirate ship where it's like, hey, you know, fuck you. Arr, I'm a pirate. I can say whatever I want. Then you have total creative freedom. And I think people are finding those outlets more and more these days. Yeah. But otherwise, are you talking about the televised state of sports media? Because the stuff that is churned out by ESPN every day is so laughably bad. Yeah. I say to myself, who on earth watches this and thinks, yeah, Stephen A., that's a perfectly solid opinion. Yeah. Nobody with a brain. And the uh, the shouting, the original uh, Skip Bayless yes. and Stephen A. Smith, that is kind of when I started like stop watching because I would get like, I would get anxious watching them because it, 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 it just, because of the vapidity of their arguments, how stupid they were. Well, Not it, that you were invested in, Oh, you've got to win this argument, Skip. Yeah. It, it was, it was, 
it was like honestly at any moment i have always felt like skip bayless could just break down and cry <laughs> at, at any moment when he's talking that means he's a good actor you know and like um uh, skip, mind you i think that those guys are good at what they do i just think the craft they're engaging in mm -hmm. is is completely non-nutritious for a thinking person yeah they're, they're, they're putting on a show uh they're doing you know i call i jokingly call it facts versus volume you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one guy has the facts the other guy yells who's gonna win the argument you know the fact that around the horn assigns points to yeah. so-called individuals with their commentary is laughable on its face. Yeah. Because when we're sitting at the bar, you and I, and we're talking about whatever, the latest Louisville game or Kentucky basketball, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are arguing a bunch of nuance and we're kind of agreeing on certain points and we're looping back to go, okay, hold on a second. You said this. It's a more natural conversation. The stuff that they put on ESPN is not natural in any way. It's designed to be confrontational it's designed to be your side your side okay battle it out and that's not how life works no as we go to old Fitzgerald old no wait we did old Fitz I didn't you went straight to it did I really oh, I think I think I said uh yeah you we know did what good old Fitz well check the tape let's go to replay go to replay <laughs> check the tape no replay allowed you said... here in the, in the bung you hole said, right <laughs> in the Rick house You'll get wrecked in the Rick House with all of this <laughs> bourbon. Yeah. It's time to get wrecked in the Rick wrecked House. In the Fred Minnick Rick House. I got wrecked. All right, now that he mentioned it. I got wrecked at Fred's. And yeah, I like that for merch. <laughs> okay. I think we're on the third one now. Yeah, we See, are. See, this is the thing. You yeah. do these two laps through. Actually, we're, we're going to start a new segment over which one we're on and just yell at each other the whole time. Okay, I know what I like. There's Doc a Stinson's definitely has a a little bit of heat to it. It's a little bit of a fastball in the outside corner. I like that. Um, you want to add some water to it? No, I don't know. Now you okay? You say adding adding? No, I don't need to. Good. You say adding water. The mm -hmm. one thing I've seen, I've seen it in multiple places. I was, I was at uh, we were at. Justin's is it Justin's, Justin's House of Bourbon? Justin's yep. House of Bourbon, mm -hmm. which is in downtown Louisville, and they have a, a pretty much a lot of bourbons you can't get, right? And they're marked up because they are hard to find, and yep. that's capitalism, whatever. Um, I have no opinion on it either way, but in there, there was a sign that said, Enjoy your bourbon any way you like with friends, and I think it was like a one, two, three, like how to enjoy your bourbon. It was like three points. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any way you like, meaning if you want to mix it with something, you can. And I've heard that before from somewhere. Maybe it was you. Maybe it was some other bourbon documentary I saw with a distiller saying, hey, look, enjoy it with ice, without ice, neat, mixed, whatever. You know, if it's bourbon and you like it, enjoy it with friends. That seems to be the the ironclad mantra. It is. And, you know, and here's the one thing I will caution you and anybody getting into this game is be mindful of who's giving you the advice. It's usually people who are selling bourbon. And so however you drink it, they're selling more bourbon. You know? <laughs> right, so, exactly. So like from my perspective, you know, I'm a, I'm a critic, you know, so I have a very different uh, philosophy. There is enjoyment time. Like if I'm at a baseball game, uh, I ain't drinking it neat. You know, I'm it's over ice. I might have it in a Coke. You know, okay. it very well could be. Right. But, and it's also not going to be uh, Weller or Pappy or right. Old Fitzgerald or Doc Swinson. It's right. going to be something, you know. Simple, real. Simple. Cool. Maybe a Makers. Maybe Makers, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, but if it's, if it's a fine, like really rare one, I really do think you should drink it neat before you make a decision on, on how you treat it. Um, it's a fair point. And if you are... If you are buying a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle, you spent anywhere from five hundred to five thousand on it, and you put it with Coca Cola. No, you know, I mean, we're that, not judging, but you're doing it wrong. That's exactly right. right. And it's like if you go to something as ubiquitous as putting it in Coca Cola, do it with Jack Daniels. Um, and I'd also argue that Jack Daniels would be better in a Coca Cola than Pappy. Funny you should mention Jack. I've noticed how here in Kentucky, 
all the places I've been with all the whiskeys and bourbons, you can't find Jack Daniels. <laughs> it's almost like Kentucky's got the big middle <laughs> finger to Tennessee. And the irony is, is, is that, that is that are we talking rivals big time? Well, uh, you know, it's not so much a rivalry because Brown Foreman um, is parent. The parent company of Brown Foreman is here. Okay, it's Louisville, and they own they own Jack, Jack Daniels. Daniels. And if it wasn't for Jack Daniels, you know, there's Jack Daniels opens a lot of doors for bourbon and Kentucky bourbon, and it's like. Um, the 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 retail side is basically just like what moves, and Jack Daniels doesn't move here. It just doesn't move here. And I did a, I picked a barrel for uh, my music festival, Bourbon and Beyond, of Jack Daniels, and it was one of the best Jack Daniels ever. And uh, they couldn't sell a bottle of it. Like really? our, our retail partner was Kroger. And like they called me up, like, hey man, we can't sell <laughs> we any can't of this sell Jack Daniels this stuff. That's crazy. <laughs> and Jack Daniels is whiskey. Yeah, so it's actually technically they're bourbon. They you know? are? So they are technically bourbon, but they choose to call themselves Tennessee whiskey. And there is an actual state law of what Tennessee whiskey is in Tennessee. It does not have a federal definition. So when they apply, when we have a new uh, trade agreement with another country, they will uh, put it into the, they will list out Tennessee whiskey as a straight bourbon with uh, previously, you know, charcoal mellowing process. Interesting. So before it goes in a barrel, it goes through like a charcoal mellowing drip. Wow. So it really is a bourbon, but they call themselves Tennessee whiskey. Correct. Yeah. It it starts it starts as a bourbon, as they put it. And the thing is, is they don't deny it. It it is a marketing uh, separation. Okay. So very good. I like this the best. Wow. And you know why I like this the best, Fred? I like the bottle the best. That is going to absolutely crush your spirit. That's where I'm at. I would buy this because of the silly bottle with uh, the Stanley Cup. All the Doc the... Swinson's is really good, but it looks like a plain wine bottle. I mean, come all, on. all the training I've put into this man. <laughs> I know. And, it's and, and he says, I like it because of the bottle. But the this, whiskey's good. What I need to do is I need, they do sell like secondary bottles you can pour your whiskey into. Mm -hmm. If you want to, right? Like a glass, what do they call that? Like a decanter? Yeah, like a decanter. Yep. Like a yep. matching set so you could even necessarily get your own logo on it if you wanted it. Sure, right? yep. And then, so I would get perhaps a Doc Swinson's, pour it into my decanter, and then I would tell people it's Doc Swinson's. Well. Now I have uncoupled the <laughs> bourbon from the bottle in case there's any bottle prejudice. Like, I don't like the look of this bottle. Stupid as it comes. But Love it. They're all good. I like them all, Fred. I really do. This decanter, though, you're, you're saying that this decanter this is lovely as well. It's not. It's not edging the the bell for. I don't know. It's it's nice. The label. I don't know. It it doesn't look like a super high class label. All right. I I don't know. It's old. It's old school, though. I know. It. Well, that's true. It is old school, and it's. Bottled the, in the, the sports connection, though, is that maybe what puts it over the top for you that yeah. they got honestly, the Stanley Cup? Honestly, it's probably not the best uh, of the whiskeys I tasted. I would say the Old Fitzgerald was probably the one that I liked the best. Okay. How about that? So there, there you we go. go. So win-win. Win-win. But uh, that's that's awesome. I, I guess kind of like in uh, as we kind of wrap up here, coming up on 30 minutes, um, you, your journey into the brown has been fun to watch, and I feel like you're starting. You're coming over to the other side now, where you're about to spend a lot of money. <laughs> are you Are you keeping an eye on me yes. as a young Jedi coming yes. along my journey, so to speak? In all the years you've known me and listened to me, you reached out to me. Uh, how many years ago? It must have been eight years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. To the national show. Yeah, and I'll be honest. I notice as I think about this. I have gone from being mostly a captain and diet drinker, mm -hmm. and then I started getting some bourbons, and I would, yes, put them in Diet Coke, and that offended many people who emailed me when I once put on social media, here watching the game with a Knob Creek and diet, and people are like, oh my God, what are you doing? And I'm like, what, did I do something wrong? And then I gradually got to the point where I would put my bourbon in a glass with some ice and I would leave it. I might have a little nip of Diet Coke on the side mm -hmm. as I'm watching a game, but I actually wouldn't want them to commingle in the same glass. And so that's progress. And maybe I'll get to the point where I drink it neat without ice. But 
I like ice and I don't mind it watering down the bourbon as the ice melts. That doesn't bother me. Right. But I know for those that want it cold but don't want it watered down, they sell the freezable rocks. Yeah, right? those those are lame. You think those are lame? Yeah, whiskey rocks are lame. Why? Uh because they, you know, for for one thing, like I'm you you're afraid of your hands getting mashed. I'm afraid of my chip my my teeth getting chipped. Oh, so oh, like right. it's yeah. so like I just have this vision of like me clunking on a rock and like chipping a tooth. So <laughs> okay. so there's that, but 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 they don't really do anything, you know. Well, they make the whiskey cold. Well, there's a lot of ways you can make whiskey cold. You can put the bottle in the in the freezer for a bit. You can put the glass in the freezer. You can have Is that like frowned a upon glass. by oh. an official official no, 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 not at all. No. And what about the single big block of ice? One yeah. of my guys said. He went and had an expensive dinner at a nice resort, mm -hmm. and they charged him three dollars for his giant cube of ice. The manpower it takes to create the clear giant cube of ice is a lot. Uh, I actually was a um, I was a spokesperson for a for an ice maker kit that created these these uh, these clear ice balls. Yeah, and the thing I think it was like a it was like five thousand dollars or something whoa i mean there's a lot of money that goes into making that little round ball well that's and true now, i did do a google search on how do you get clear ice cubes and i quickly found out it's complicated and there's nothing easy about it no there's nothing easy about the it. the way that ice freezes and the mm -hmm. air and the bubbles that are trapped in there and yep. how they radiate to the surface and then you gotta do this i've had guys email me saying they do it by freezing a big block of ice and then they cut it up with a saw, a, a precision saw that has the clear part, and they throw away the part that's cloudy. Yeah, and there you go. That's the that's that's how I know you're going to the next step, is because you're googling how to do clear ice. You, exactly. and so uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna come to a point where you're like, I just spent how much on bourbon? I just did what? And then you're gonna be like, I have to start drinking this more so I can write it off. And then I have to have a sponsor so I can get free stuff. And, you know, and it's, uh, you go down the rabbit hole quick, my friend. Well, the best thing about bourbon is I know when I have one, mm. it relaxes me. It makes me happy. And the best part is, like you said at the top, it's best when you're having with friends. Amen to that. Great to have you on the show, man. Thank you, Fred. An honor. And, mm. of course, make sure you are checking him out on all the Zabe cast and just look for his name, Steve Zabin. Tell everyone how to spell it. Charlie, Zulu, Alpha, Bravo, Echo. You as a military man knows those terms very well. Absolutely. The phonetic right. alphabet. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.